and then you know as i got down to this this the push was hitting the bottom and not being able to do anything and being like hey like you've done this before like why can't we do it now and it is that like leaving your ego behind because it is a really it's a it's a hard thing to to be at a high level and admit you need help or admit you need to go backwards a little bit welcome to the run form podcast i'm bobby mcgee running mechanics expert. And I'm Matt Pandola, your run-specific strength coach. Matt and I have been working together for almost a decade on some of the top athletes in the world, and we've decided to share that process with you guys. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to the Run Forum podcast. Today, we have a very special guest, Kerry Dunnigan. How are you, brother? Good. How are you doing, Matt? Awesome, awesome. We have a great story. Kerry has a runner's story that I believe really speaks truth to me and the process that you've gone through to find your joy and love of running, to lose it for a while, and then to have it come back to you with a lot of good work and dedication towards that love of the sport. I love these kind of stories, Carrie. First, we're going to let the audience know just a little bit about you, your background, you know, who is speaking to you today. Carrie. Yeah, awesome. So yeah, my name's Carrie. I've known Matt since, since high school around 2010. Um, it's been, been a long time and it's been an awesome journey. Um, started with him my senior year of high school to kind of take that next step to kind of go from that all right, um, high school runner to like, Hey, can I run in college? Um, and got the opportunity with Matt to kind of break that 10 minute barrier and then go on and, and run in college, um, have some great experiences, you know, do the steeplechase, super exciting race, had so much fun running that in college and running some some solid times in that 920 range and then you know also I'm I'm a big trail guy now so cross country was more my thing in college as opposed to track so ran ran the 8k there around 25 minutes um and you know it's it's been something where I've always been pushed to go to that next level and and been run just run 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 um it's it's kind of been my my whole life I love it um I even started you know working at Rito running company here on the floor slinging shoes and then had the opportunity to work for a running brand um on as a tech rep drive around meet some awesome people in the the running community um and now kind of work in their marketing department um in our uh portland hq um so running is is everything i do it's my job it's my uh, pastime it's my future it's it's what i enjoy spending my time doing i i love learning about it um and so uh, what kind of happened? Um, you know, first, Gary, I'll say we were on a run last night and that's what you do, right? You come into town and you say, hey, Matt, I'm here. Can we go for a run? So when we say you love running, we're, we're not just saying that you love running in the traditional like, hey, you know, I love ice cream or something, right? You live for running <laughs> and you, you love running as much as anybody I know. So a couple things that I know Bobby will want to cue in on here, but you actually had an opportunity back in the day in high school to be able to, like you said, go after that 10 minute barrier. And for some people, they might be thinking, oh gosh, that's so fast. And it, and it is, but for others, they might be thinking, okay, so he loves to compete. And at the time, that's how I treated it. I was more of a performance coach for you. I wish I had gotten you earlier in your high school career. I got you late in your senior year, but we still got a lot done for that last track season. But really what I learned about you over time is that you want to run for life and it's more about longevity. And this whole process that we're going to discuss today was about your ability to get out there, get out on the trails, have that wonderful run crossing streams yesterday, running with the dog, you know, talking to people along the way, looking at the canyons, listening to the crickets, all of that I know is what feeds you. And your ability to be able to do that now is so much more important than that first break the 10 minute barrier, right? Yeah, I, I want I want to back it up. Just uh, thinking about our poor listeners here. You know, so Firstly, great to meet you, Kerry. That's fantastic. And I just think you have a wonderful running name, Kerry Dunnigan. That just like, it resonates for me. I love it. I love it. So it's really good to meet you. 
And I was hoping when Matt said we're going to have uh, Kerry on the on the podcast, I'm going, yay, finally a regular runner and, and not a superstar. And then you start talking, I'm going, oh, shit, he's a great runner. You know, so um, so let's just start off. The first thing is, is you know, you said uh, I was, you know, 10 minutes in, in high school, right? And, and I just want our listeners to understand this is 3,000 meter steeplechase. So this is a little under two miles, right? And it's over 27 solid hurdles made out of wood that big, right? They don't move. If you hit them, they don't fall over. Seven water jumps, no rhythm, a, an absolute strength person's race. It's, it's, it's the most heroic race in the Olympics to, to watch the men's and the women's steeplechase. So just so people understand the nature of that race. And then also when you're talking about, you know, your thing is cross-country running, right? And, and trail running. So people understand, you, you know, you're able to run five miles over um, uneven terrain at five minute miles. And so that people just know the level. So, sometimes people don't understand how good trail runners are, right? Uh, you know, unless they go out there and they try and experience that, right? And you guys add that new wrinkle into the, into the equation. It's not just how far and it's not just how fast, it's how many feet of elevation gain as well which is a, a huge part of the conversation. So I'm really looking forward to having a chat with you, Kerry. Yeah, no, it's it's great to meet you finally, Bobby. I mean, working with Matt, I've, I've heard your name, I don't even know how many times, and um, always get great, insightful um, learnings or quotes or, or things from Matt through through Bobby. So um, it's, it's good to, I think, meet you for the first time um, after all these years. So, yeah. I think that's the magic of having a podcast where we haven't met before, right? People get to see, you know, us interacting and, and, and where do we start with? And I think one of the main reasons why uh, Matt thought that this would be very useful to our listeners is the fact that you had a near career ending injury, right? Which I think a lot of our listeners can relate to. We've just had this situation where where Cat Matthews was phenomenal performance at the world uh, uh you know 70.3 championship just just magnificent and just a short while ago she was involved in a horrific bike crash right and so was she always capable of getting on the podium yes she was always but it just makes the story so much greater because now you start to understand the person not just the talent and what it takes to to get all the way back up to the top with that kind of thing and you and you've got one of those stories, and 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 run form has played a a large part of that story. And I think for me, a, a good theme today is for people to say, okay, it's fine if I if I have Matt in my backyard, right, and we get to work together, and it's fine if I get to see Bobby twice a week and and get to work with him. I'm I'm sure I could I could get better, right? But how can I get better by doing you know a twelve week program with with no input and. Uh, and that's uh, that's a good place for us to go to straight away. Just tell us about your experience. You know, how did you happen upon run form? Tell us about how you got hurt, and and you know what 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 were your fears during that period of time, and 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 what did you think about your ability to returning to running? Yeah, yeah. So I'll I'll start with with kind of what happened. So I was doing a trail half marathon. Um, in in the first mile of the race, it was nice just easy downhill so clipping off pr pretty quick little damp out just made a, a bad decision and stepped on on a rock on a turn and just foot went straight out from under me and just kind of fell right back onto my back and so right out of college I had had a herniated disc repaired um, which caused some nerve damage so it's kind of one of those moments where I was like oh oh no like it, what what have I done and I got back up and I, I ran the rest of the race and, and I felt I felt fine and uh, towards the end, I started to like, after I finished, I, I was walking around, I was like, ah, oh, my, my foot really hurts. And then in the next kind of like six months, I kept dealing with these like little, just annoying injuries that I could kind of work through. Um, and then one day just doing, doing a workout, I kind of felt like, oh, I'm having a lot of pain through, through my groin and my pubic symphys area. And it, it took a long time. It took almost a year to really get the right MRI images and talk to the right people to figure it out. But ultimately, I had a, had a tear in uh, one of my abductor muscles and I had a slight fracture on my hip and I had developed a couple edemas in those areas. And so that had caused some issues where I'd keep trying to get back into running and it would hurt. And so I'd just be on this constant up and down, um, not really getting anywhere, 
um, not really falling off too much until a certain point where I just, I couldn't do, do anything anymore. So I'd been, you know, working with Matt in the past. So I, you know, knew like, okay, this is how I do a return to run program or like, Hey, here's the strength training I was doing. Like, let's try and do some of that. And so finally, like, you know, talk with Matt pretty regularly and he's like, Hey, this is what I'm doing with Bobby. This is, this is run form. And so I kind of started into it and I was like, yeah, I've done a bunch of this stuff before, but I'm, I'm past that. Like I'm, I'm an athlete. I've, I've done this stuff forever. Like I don't need to really focus in on these basics. Like maybe I can like skip a few steps. Um, and so finally about 11, 10 months ago, uh, beginning of last November, I was out at an event working, um, and tried to go on a run with a couple of the guys at work and just made it about a mile and was like, I cannot move. Like my like nerve is on fire. My back is seizing up. Like I just had to stop and, and walk back to the hotel. And so I texted Matt and he sent me some like really go- good mobility exercises to like help me like be able to move that weekend. And then from that point on, it was, it was a, Hey, I need to do the basic stuff. I need to stop focusing on what I was able to do. And like, let's just focus what I can do now. And what I can do now is nothing. So like, well, we need to go back to the basics. So I spent the next, you know, 12 weeks just like, hey, run form is is my life, like doing these little things um, and getting back into that routine and that habit. And I think that's something that I have really loved about running is like, hey, I have this this training protocol. I have this habit that I've built and um, I just feel I just feel better when I'm doing it. So being able to like go to the program, be like, okay, here's what I'm doing today. And like, I accomplished this and like, awesome, I'm taking a step forward. And so building in that habit was super helpful for me and having that programming to look at and go through the videos and and not only like just see an exercise, but learn about it and then take that step. Cause that was kind of, you know, I've worked with Matt, I've learned all sorts of things, but um, being able to to really focus in on those basics and learn about them has really helped me to not only create my own programming for running, but kind of like be like, Hey, like, I don't know what level I'll compete at again, but I don't ever want to be in a situation where I have a two and a half, three year span where I can, I can barely do what I really enjoy doing, which is getting out and running. And so that, um, has been like the best part of, of doing this, this run form and getting into this habit and, and getting back to run. again. Yeah. One thing I want to just point out with Carrie and his story, for one, there was some back issues we can talk about from collegiate steeplechase and probably also eventually just the pure volume and intensity of collegiate running, but also with the loading and the progressive overload. We are now just today going over what he can now do for progressive overload. He's been doing run form for 11 months. So that's the point. We talk about this a lot. Let's get towards mastery in these principles. But now you've come so far. Now I think you are ready to start getting back into that progressive overload that really was on defeated mechanics before and we just weren't able to get the results you did formally before your injuries. And so that's an important thing I think to recognize because Bobby and I are broken records when it comes to getting back to, we keep saying the basics, run form is athletic and it is certainly about coordination and control first and foremost. I think that developing that foundation But last night when we were on the run, you said something really significant to me because I talked about how a lot of times people need to go uh, to the basics and they need to start to the basics. And then you said, or go back to the basics, right? And so it is something that I do believe somebody should keep in their arsenal. And over time, once you've gone towards mastery, you can really hold on to what you've had. You can main gain now with progressive overload but it's still going to be a part of your program over the next year as well, right? So that's, you know, important to me to, to bring yeah. out. It, it's phenomenal, and I, I do sound like a broken record, you know, but it's phenomenal how many sports that the athletes at the highest level say that all the time. But not only do they say that, it is just mind-blowing to me that in all those sports, 
that the average athlete or the amateur athlete understands it but doesn't practice it, right? So learning, starting with the fundamentals, learning the fundamentals, maintaining the fundamentals, losing your way, going back to the fundamentals, that's the conversation with the elite athlete. Back to the fundamentals, back to the fundamentals, right? Because there's so many little bells and whistles that you can do which really can make these little leaps in performance. But if you leave behind the fundamentals, you lost again. This is wonderful. I'm, I'm, you know, privileged to know one of the most respected and uh, U.S. Olympic athletes in triathlon, Hunter Kemper. He was, uh, he's a four-time Olympian in triathlon, you know, from 2000 all the way through to 2012. And, um, when I finally got to start working with Hunter and we were at camps and stuff like that, and he'd always tell people, you know, that I'd worked with all of all of these Olympians, but then he'd say he was sorry he didn't meet me earlier. And, you know, Hunter said the same thing about nutrition too. He was sorry he didn't learn about nutrition earlier. But here's the thing. When I started working with Hunter, he couldn't do the fundamentals. He just realized, oh my goodness, he couldn't do the fundamentals. And, he, you know, he also had had a really bad injury in the lead up to the 2012 Olympics. All right. And, uh, he, you know, he was in contention in the, around the 2016 Olympics. But that's about the time when he realized that he had neglected the fundamentals um, and maybe didn't even know what the fundamentals are. Right. And so what's almost shocking to me at the moment is, is how useful it is for people to start doing what Kerry's doing is to understand their own running and then realize where it was and then realize where they're aiming to get back to. And it's not a performance thing, right? It's a feel thing. It's a health thing. It's a knowing that, oh, this is how my body used to feel, needs to feel, wants to feel. You know, so that's pretty, pretty exciting to keep getting these illustrations of of how that process works. Yeah. And I think people, again, who are thinking about their own journeys and relating this to Carrie, you brought up an important point in there, Bobby, about how we were hoping that Carrie was a little bit more of your, let's say, average pace runner. So it's relatable or transferable, right? But I know that this is transferable because your story is about being able to do this when you're 80. There's no question. Your main journey is about consistency and it's not as much about competition, at least, and especially now at this point in your life. And I think in part, it's because what happened to you happened for a reason. And then you made a reason for why it happened and you did something to move you back to what you love. And that speaks to all of us because we've all been through something. And we've all had what we love taken away from us. Bobby has, I have. And back in the day when I was first coaching you, you heard Bobby's name way back then. It's before I even knew Bobby. Why? Because he was and is the world's best running coach, in my opinion, and focused on the fundamentals. And so that is what is more common than people would think about the elites, Right, not the paces they're running. That's not transferable to us. Right? We're mere mortals. But what they do with the basics and how they build off those basics, and the fact that they're willing to repeat those, so that it is ingrained, 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 and so then we can maintain, maintain, maintain at our own levels in our own journey for our own reasons, our own why. That's what I want to try to cement into people's minds: is don't get thrown off that this is for an elite. Yes, elites do it because it works, but this is the stuff that works for all of us. Even if you don't ever do run form, just know that it's the basics that are the best. It's it's what we kind of, I dub as the Miyagi method, right? Just do the basics, do them better, and you can win in your own journey. Uh, it's, you know, the seeds of what we really want to put out in the world, Matt, lie in, in the basis of this conversation, right? And I think that one of the things I've learned about, uh, about myself as a coach in triathlon 
is that you cannot stand alone. You you can't do it all, right? When I when I started coaching, I was mother, father, physiotherapist, coach, massage therapist. I mean, in in the in the Barcelona Olympics, I was the team masseur. I only found that out when I got to the games because there was no masseur, you know. So it, it, these kind of things that happen. Uh, just teach us that there's so much more to it, right? No triathlon coach can know as much about the run, the bike, and the swim as a swim specialist or a bike specialist or a run specialist. Just not possible, right? So when it comes to to Kerry's story, it's uh, I, I wanted to mention that understanding that it's not one PT, it's not one chiropractor, it's not one coach, it's not you know, it's not one soft tissue therapist. It's it's a team approach, right? And 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 that whole saying of when when the student is ready, the teacher will arrive, right? And you think of the the humility that it took to get down to that level, Kerry, where you had to say, okay, I I'm a complete beginner here. If I ever want to run again, I'm going to have to start with the basics, right? So that people understand a PT, their first even if they're a sports PT, right? Their first aim is to reduce pain, right? Is to help manage the athlete's pain, right? And then their next duty is that of rehabilitation. They want to bring you back to where you were. But Matt and I find that in many cases where you were wasn't good enough. It's not allowing you to train to the extent that you are capable of training physiologically because you just don't have the underpinnings. You just don't have the structural and coordination and skills underpinnings to be able to do that training, right? And it's something that I harp on a lot, right? We, we, we have a lot of knowledge about how to develop our engines, and we have a lot of coaches that are very skilled at developing engines, but we have less expertise in the endurance world specifically at how to develop the superstructure, how to develop the chassis, how to develop the limbs and the legs to be able to deal with that training, right? And then I love, you know, Matt introduced me to this concept of prehabilitation, right? We know the run training that you will need to do and we have an understanding of where your structure needs to be to be able to do that training. It's very easy to look at a runner who's doing pretty well but you can see the compensations and you know, okay, if we increase the volume just a little bit or if we increase the speed just a little bit, we're going to run into trouble. And the whole idea with run form is, is I don't want to do run form necessarily when I'm in trouble. I want to do run form so that I don't get into trouble. And I want to talk about the three C's of run form for just a second based off of what you just said, Bobby, because interestingly enough, I was talking to a few of our members and they were saying the arrowhead down concept confuses me. I was like, okay, interesting. Let's explain that more then. And if you do look at a visual of me right now, but I've got my thumb right at my xiphoid process here, and I'm just slightly bringing that, uh, I'm bringing that chest slightly down from there, that position. This is an arrowhead and it's pointing down. But in other words, we tend to have a longer belly and now we have a shorter belly, okay? So we're shortening that line a little bit. And you can kind of think of that from the bottom of your chest to your uh, your ribs, right? But it keeps going down, down past your belly button and all the way to your groin. And the reason why I say that is because we have to discuss at least a little bit why these concepts helped you so much with your groin injury. And by the way, you said abductor before adductor, right? But we're saying, yeah, bringing our hips in towards the midline adduction. But in other words, you imagine that that those hips are a pyramid in reverse and you're trying to bring those pelvic bones in a little bit more towards your groin. And so that whole concept of being compact, that's essentially what that arrowhead down does for us. It starts to do. And then we have to work on proximal stiffness, right? So that whole trunk is like a can, right? And, it, and in that can, you have your insides, obviously, right? And all the things that start to move the body from there. So the way I think of it is if you have a long belly, you've now popped the top of that can. 
if you step on the can, all of that is going to gush out and you're going to lose so much energy and power and you're going to open yourself up to injuries as well. So you can think of that can now being crushed and all of that liquid being your energy, your power production, right? Your force output potential. So if I keep that from popping, now you can stand on a can, right? Without it crushing, right? You can put your whole body weight on it. And that's that's the first concept to start to understand. And that's what we start with with run form, as you know now. And then we go into the next part, which is that distal athleticism, in other words, connecting, right? Connecting our whips. And that all improves our cadence, in other words, our power efficiency as well, right? So those three C's, I think, important to talk about and how it actually helped your story. And let's also just remember that we did have that prior back injury as well from steeplechase in college and even some uh, surgery, right? So we can talk about just a little bit of that because I think it does relate. How many rudders do we know, Bobby, with back injuries, with hip injuries, right? So, yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, just talk about the whole back concept. But you just created a great opening, Matt. So just before Kerry takes off on that critical part of the conversation, I want to add to that conversation about the top being popped, right? So the 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 conversation of, of of the tin can that you can stand on when it's stacked, I mean, that's the critical part. Matt spoke about what's happening at the front end. We spoke about that exhalation to set it and forget it, right? To get that front end of the chest out. But it's also very critical to understand that now what happens at the back is there's a lengthening in the lumbar spine. And that lengthening allows some rotation in the lumbar spine, which improves the arm swing. But the whole reason from a mechanical, run mechanical standpoint, why we want to do all that is twofold, right? One is we release leg extension, all right? So when you pull your, when you pull your chest back and you pop the top, your, your pelvis actually anteriorly rotates. You lose spring in the hips, but also by being pulled back in the chest, you're shortening your ability to achieve your optimal stride length. All right, and then lastly, and probably the most important part of that is, is when the pop, when when you stack the chest properly in the front, all right, or you unpop the top, you shifting your center of gravity forward and you creating momentum, and that's the primary. And when you do that, that's why that connection of the chest to the pelvis in the anterior plane increases your cadence because it turns your running from proactive having to lift your legs up to reactive not thinking about it your legs will reset automatically because you have that forward momentum going on so that 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 the dynamic balance created by properly connecting the chest to the pelvis is the hugest gift of that of that whole concept Gary, why don't you tell us a little bit about your history too when it comes to your back yeah yeah. So yeah, going kind of right out, right out of college, um, finished, um, the, my finished in the halfway for a year. So I did my red shirt. It's so all I did was cross country, my final year of college. Um, and going towards the, the end of that season, I was in our, our team that was going to run a nationals and just started to struggle, had some hamstring stuff and kind of push, pushed through. And then once I was done, that kind of hamstring turned into nerve pain all the way down. The leg. And so Finally got uh, MRI and they're like, oh, you have a herniated disc in your back. And, you know, went through the, all the steps like, hey, take some NSAIDs, do PT, let's get an injection. And so, you know, being that young athlete and being like, oh, I can't, can't do this anymore. We've got to fix it now. Like, I've got to have surgery. And it was just like, just stuck in the front of my mind, kind of like coming out of high school being like, run D1. It's the only option. Like, you, you can't think past that, that one thought in your head. So... I was stuck on this idea that someone had to go in and fix it. And so went in, had the disc repaired. Um, and then, you know, I, you know, went through some, some life changing kind of situations and left Oregon, came back to Reno and, and started to work with Matt and really build up strength again. And so I, I even, there's a great photo of me finishing like one of my last college races, my, my head's back, my arms are out, my, my hips are collapsed and going up and, and I have a picture of running a, a road race in Reno and it just looked strong. And so like 
I did build back up and I, and I got stronger and I had that like fitness, you know, set where I could, I could keep pushing further. But what I think really the, the problem came down to is I, I never went back and focused on, on the basics. And so right out of college and I actually kind of had a new passion that I've that kind of dug into, which was tea and, and culture around tea and this whole, this whole concept of, of the importance of nothing. And so like a teapot doesn't work because it has clay around it. It works because of the empty space. It's that the importance of nothing, that, that, that basic thing of just that is what makes it important. And so as I have, you know, kept going and training, I, I basically got hurt again in a very similar way. Obviously I fell and I had the other aspects, but again, that herniated disc came back that the fundamentals were never worked on where when I did fall, I was hurt in, in the same way again. And so again, had that thought on my mind, like, Hey, I've, I've got to get this fixed. Like this time it was worse. The bottom half of my leg was numb after a while. And like, I had that nerve pain. And part of that was more, I was a tech rep for on, and I was driving, you know, so many, so many miles a week, so many miles a month, all the time, sitting in a car, not allowing my body to do what it needs to, to recover and, and spend time working on those fundamentals. So I got another herniated disc back in 2021, um, and was still just keep, I just kept just slamming my head against the wall thinking it was going to change the result. And finally, when I like really looked at it and said, Hey, something, something is wrong. I've, I've put on all this mileage from high school all the way through college into now doing trail running, which, uh, adding in the Spartan races, jumping off stuff, doing all of this, this extra, um, work on my body and not working on the things I need to do to actually build a base and get better. And so it, it took me completely getting to the point where I, I couldn't run anymore. Um, I couldn't be as fit as I want. I couldn't go into the gym and do things, um, which was very hard for me to get through. So, you know, just like, Hey, I'm just going to focus on work. That's what I'll do. And like, it just, for me, like I love working for a shoe company, but like where my build my passion, where I, I feel energized is, is my training and, and running and doing those things. So not having that and then really focusing and working. And and so those back issues were never addressed until I stopped and worked on the basics. I worked on the, the importance of, of nothing on, on the basics with my back to really heal and move forward as opposed to just keep trying to go through. And I, I always remember people would ask me, like, I'd be doing power walking workouts on the track. And like, why are you doing that? I'm like, well, I want to get better. Like this is, this is the start. This is like, I can't, I can't run a workout, but I can power walk this and, and really work on, on how I'm doing or power walk hills. And the looks you get when you're in the middle of a city, uh, power walking up a hill is, is always a lot <laughs> of fun. But, um, it was just those things that a lot of people just didn't understand, like why I would spend so much time doing these little things. And it's cause I haven't been able to do anything. And so this is, this is what I need to do to keep moving forward. So yeah, it's, I love part of that story. I'm laughing too, because when I first knew of Kerry, I was a coach and I would watch him compete and he was a fierce competitor. He was very serious business about what he was doing. It takes a little while to get to know Kerry, by the way. And <laughs> Kerry certainly didn't want to get to know me at the time. I think par I, partially I laughed because there was a, a young man, Jordan Cardenas, who is also on the team. You were the captain, I believe, and Jordan was up and coming, but you were talking about uh, these key things that I believe are so important, right? We're going up to elevation, higher up, and we're hiking in the mountains, right? But I would get, what is that doing for my for my 5K, right? Or what is that doing, right? Why would I be doing that? And Terry, I don't know if I've ever really talked to you about why you decided to even start with me, but I remember I was kind of shocked that you walked in the door and uh, you left your ego at the door. I will say it didn't take much for you to really buy in, but I'm just smiling as you're talking because you're now talking about what we actually started with. And at the time I knew I had to give you a little bit of a reset and we had to get some of that intensity out and we had to build up. And of course, 
you end up having your PRs and the rest is history. But would you talk a little bit about what left you to that decision to start with the basics with somebody like me knowing that it was probably not what you're used to? Yeah, I think that's, I think what has always helped me is, is having the right people around to like push you in the right direction. And so initially meeting Matt, like I would hate to admit this to, to them, but like my parents really were like, this is what we're going to do. And you're going to do this. I was like, I was just in a, in a place where that, that high school ego of, of the, the team is the most important and you don't go against the team. And like, this is what we do. And this is what we've always done. And so you just, you learn that from a freshman, go sophomore, junior, like it just gets ingrained into you and you think, oh, I can't do anything else. And so just that one little push. And so at that time it was my parents being like, you're going to do this. And it really did help me grow as an athlete. And then, you know, as I got down to this, this, the push was hitting the bottom and not being able to do anything and being like, Hey, like you've done this before. Like, why can't we do it now? And it is that like, leaving your ego behind because it is a really it's a it's a hard thing to to be at a high level and admit you need help or admit you need to go backwards a little bit and so that has been a really hard that that was the hardest thing for me in in getting into this program was forgetting like hey this is what i used to be and it's like i can't i can't keep focusing on the fact that like hey i could run up to the top of of Mount Rose and back down faster than, you know, most people would ever dream of doing. Um, and it's like, Hey, I need to walk. I need to hike. I need to, I can't just be what I used to be. I have to, to focus on what I am now and kind of release that ego a little bit. Um, and I've never been the biggest ego, you know, I feel like I can go out on a group run with people run in the back and just kind of chill, but it's, it's definitely something that you always have a little bit of. Um, and so that was the biggest thing for me getting into this program was I'll let, admitting I needed help. <laughs> and I'll let Bobby speak on this, but I just want to say it's making so much sense to me now remembering the first assessment we did with your dad staring at you. I don't think you said a word to me for the first three weeks, but after that, I think you started feeling differences and then we started chatting and I'm like, oh, that's what he sounds like when he talks. Uh, so I've always kind of <laughs> know that, but leaving, uh, putting your ego aside as a senior in high school is a pretty, pretty mature thing to do. So I get, I, I certainly give you a lot of credit for that, but. Oh, I mean the, the amount of fantastic conversations that you raised right from the beginning, Kerry is to starting talking about the teapot. Now I didn't even realize you, you were the philosopher, right? And to be that vulnerable to discuss that conversation and and being able to say, oh, it's embarrassing, but it's not embarrassing. It's in, it's freeing, right? That your parents forced you to go. It's it's a beautiful thing. So let's start with the teapot analogy. I absolutely love that analogy, right? Because the, the way that I take pressure off myself as a coach is to say, I cannot give the athlete anything. I can only uncover what they already have. And so my skill is in the uncovering not in the giving. I can't, I can't run a five-minute mile. I can't teach people to run a five-minute mile, right? Um, that comes from within. That comes from their talent and so on. The, the teapot thing I used right in the beginning of my book, I stole this from the famous French composer Debussy who said, music is not in the notes. It's in the spaces between the notes. And then Miles Davis continued with that concept saying, um, you know, I'm not necessarily a great trumpeter but my, my skill lies in understanding the usage of the spaces of the quietness between the notes to make that happen. And so I think that's absolutely huge. And that comes right into the ego conversation, right? You cannot be a competitive runner without ego. Well, what you need to do is distinguish your ego, right? And you're clearly an, an individual who does that because you don't make decisions about getting better and going backwards and starting again and restarting uh, if you're not vulnerable, and if you're not vulnerable, um, you know, there's then you know everything, right? And and so that comes to the team conversation. And I sometimes think that this team conversation is is a little bit too two dimensional. There's plenty of research that shows that the team concept is incredibly valuable, right? Now we talk about 
the ego of the coach that coaches that team, right? And then I like the conversation that says great coaches are ones that create environments of excellence and then place athletes within those environments and then lets, lets the magic happen. So they're leaders. They're not necessarily coaches from that standpoint. And there's a lot to be said about that. But I think if you can look back at the value of the team, the value of the camaraderie, the value of allowing yourself to take on the discipline, you know, the thing about high school sports or college sports is is in high school, you're not getting paid. In college sports, you're getting a scholarship maybe, right? And so now that impacts how you view your discipline, all right? And that can create resentment, resentment and bitterness and stuff like that. But at high school, you need that at that stage with your brain development, right? But also then the the insight that your parents have, and sometimes you have no choice, right? You have to choose one or the other. And, and sometimes that is, do I choose the camaraderie or do I choose the performance, you know? But I think if you can contain all of those in your heart, like you clearly have done, then, then you get to those steps and you can look back and say, no, the first time I was there, that was the right thing to do. Then I needed to bump my head a couple of times and saying, look, the first time I went down this road, there was cheese at the end of that tunnel. And then I kept going down that tunnel. There wasn't any cheese, but I didn't consider that there might be some other tunnels to go down. I kept going down the same tunnel. But then I had the, the wisdom to say, okay, this is this. And then your three weeks of not saying anything is magnificent, right? Because it speaks not only to, to Matt's patience and his empathy and his understanding of the process, but your willingness to do that. Because there's not a lot of high school boys that would have said, ah, screw this. I'll find a way. I'll tell my parents, drop me off outside the door, and then I'm going to go around the corner and do whatever, but I'm, I'm not going to go in the door. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge success story. And given the reason why we thought you'd be a great guest on the podcast, this to me just takes it to another level. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think even Matt, just me not even, not even speaking a lot, I think he picked up on it. And even like, yes, he was my, my coach for, for running, but I still remember one of the first times we had like an athlete award and I was very new to the program, showed up and he's like, all right, you got to go up and talk. I was like, I got to do what? I was like, yeah, you got to, you got to go up and you got to say what you're doing, where you're going to college, all this stuff. I got, I said like three words and I walked up. It's like, my name's Carrie. I'm going to Portland state. And I was off this, like as fast as I could be. But like, it was those little <laughs> things of like, Hey, we're going to, you know, we're not just, I'm going to try to help, but I'm not going to push too far. And like, I definitely had, social anxiety, all sorts of things going up through high school and all the way. And, and then, you know, I got into, you know, working at Reno running company and then basically working a job where it was to go around and talk to people and, and get them to, you know, like the thing that I'm showing them. And so I would have never gotten to where I am within the running industry without those little pushes, not only in on the running side, but just those behavioral things that, that I don't know, I feel like Matt picked up on. One, one thing I, do you want to share about your story that I absolutely love and get quite emotional about actually is I was talking to somebody from on at a local race and we are going to be putting something on with Reno running company on and Chelsea Sodaro, who's, who's uh, sponsored with on. And so he was talking about that, but then he said, Oh, so Carrie, and he was talking about you and he was just, he, he was saying such wonderful things about you and how much you've been able to contribute and do for the company. But the main thing he was talking about is just how much you clearly love what you do and how much you love running and all of the social skills that you're using now based off of organically the love of a sport. That's to me what really matters, right? Not again, the times that you're running or, or how fast you are today as much as how much is it filling that, you know, part of your, I guess the teapot analogy will go back to there, right? And, and ultimately, I think when it comes to my conclusion here, and then I'll let you guys wrap up, it's going to be about what we talked about again on our run last night, but so many times over and over again is, look, Run, run form is a ready-made program. You don't have to buy it. You don't have to do that to get results. I never take credit. Bobby doesn't for what people do. And here's why, because 
if you do it, but you do it without consistency, it's not going to serve you well. What you've done so beautifully is really committing yourself to a process. And I know you have some feelings about that where, where so many people that you know in the sport and around you that are still complaining about the same restrictions, the same injuries, the same reasons. I call it the excuse train that went off the tracks, right? And they're still telling the same story. I remember years ago when Bobby was talking to our youth group and saying, get sick of telling the same story. Just keep saying it over and over again till you're sick of hearing yourself say it. And now you're ready for a change, right? And that's, to me, I think the most beautiful example about you is that you're really living the life. And, uh, you know, from, from that point, I'll let you guys close out, but, uh, such an honor and, and privilege to have you here today. And, uh, thank you for, for your story. No, I appreciate working with you, Matt. It's been amazing. Yeah, that's so awesome, Kerry. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll also finish off with one, one last question for you, Kerry. And, and thank you so much for being willing to talk to us. Um, and that's, you said something very important, right? Uh, and this goes back to the to the humility and the transparency. You said a lot of the things in run form you knew about and had done, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Tell us, I mean, I'm sure there were some unique things that you'd not seen before, but especially for a, a somebody who's gone through the collegiate system, knows college running, um, what was different about the drills themselves? that you noticed in terms of how was it laid out? How were the drills explained? How were they progressed? That was different to what you would experience in any other setting that made them stick for you. Yeah. Um, so I think there, there are a few different things about, about the, the program and the drills and, and that really kind of resonated and, and really stuck with me and allow, allowed me to, to kind of move forward. And um, I think the formatting of that 12 week program, I think a lot of, of programs are like, you know, Hey, here's five exercises, do these for a week. And then now next thing is like, okay, here's five different work exercises. Let's do these for a week where this program was like built on like, Hey, here's, here's what you're going to do today. And it's going to build on the next day. And then you're going to kind of, you know, integrate the, the different types of movements, the banded, um, Dynamics. dynamics dynamics and um even the terrible i no, sorry uh, load in mobility um like aspects yep. of like learning about each one of those movements and like when it can be added in so like now i don't follow like that you know a day-to-day -day program but i know like hey i'm doing you know an easy run today and like i should do these three things and then end with maybe loaded mobility today or or something where like I can build out that program where I've, I've learned the movements and I've learned why I'm doing the movements. So I can, I can keep going by myself as opposed to just being like reliant along, Hey, I need someone to lay out every single week for me or else I can't do it. Um, so I think that has been a big part of why this has been so, so successful for me is I'm not just, you know, doing the drill. Um, I'm learning why it's important. I'm going through the movement. I'm finding the ones that work well for me and some that, you know, I did in the beginning, but now I don't do too often. Like I don't, you know, this one, you know, maybe isn't as helpful for me, or I feel like maybe I'm not restricted in that area as much. So maybe it's something I just throw in like once a week, as opposed to like, Hey, I need to do this, you know, four times a week, um, for a certain drill. So I think that having learning it, getting into the habit, but then allowing yourself to be like, Hey, I can make this work for me. Um, and so, cause you know, some people are, you know, they only have, you know, however many minutes in the day to do something like this, but you can set up a program within this that works for you to make it work with your life. Okay. And even with, can you give, can you give an example of an exercise that you knew very well from your college days or from your high school days that you had an aha moment about with the way that it was put forward this time that you go like, oh, I know how to do that. And then you go, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. I never used to do that or that wrinkle. Is there, can you have a good example of that? Um, yeah, I would say a lot of the stuff with like hip hinge with like the ABC hip hinge, things like stuff I've done. I mean, I've done things like this with Matt forever, um, but it's just, 
going through some of those motions. And I think a lot of that for that hip motion is with my back and the nerve issues down my leg. And like, I would do things like I wouldn't even notice I'm doing. So like my left knee, sometimes with that nerve pain, while I try to go like bend would slide forward slightly. And I would not pick up on that. Whereas as I've gone through run form, even just during the day, if I do something where I'm like bending down, I'm like, Oh, my knees forward. Like I need to fix that. Like I can feel So it's, so even like, even doing those movements in the past and learning everything, I feel like now I can actually pick up on what I'm doing, not only in the movement, but in like the kind of the day-to-day life where I can actually feel those things as opposed to just doing the stuff in like the gym and college, like you do it, you're done, you're out, you're off having fun doing your classes, I guess. Now it's, I can actually do the things not only while I'm working out, but I can pick up on what my body's doing. If I, if I didn't talk again, I wouldn't be me. Right. So last, last, <laughs> yeah. last thing I'll say, <laughs> but I can't help to say thank you because again, with banded dynamics, there's so much going on there with external cues that are helping you to learn proper movement patterns. And I think of it as neuromuscular reeducation. And a lot of times just those pathways that Bobby talks in the concepts of myelinization, all of those things that you just described by using the bands in his movements. That's exactly why we started with bands. It's convenient, but it's also where people need to to either start with or get back to, to get more out of their progressive loading patterns. So that's where I still say, hey, if you want to do our strength training with weights, yes, that's fantastic. Of course, that's what I do for a living, but I want you to start with banded dynamics And that's a perfect example of why, right? And that's why you're ready for loaded uh, progression patterns with more traditional weight training now, in my opinion. Fantastic. Oh, well, thank you so much. It was uh, really great to get to meet you and great to spend time with you. Just, uh, I I can't believe how time flies when, when when we're really caring about the conversation, right? And caring about the person. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great chatting. We care about carriage. (laughs) All right. So next time, everyone, thanks for listening. And thank you again for being on today, Gary. As always, thanks for listening to the Run Form podcast. And as a reminder, we offer a totally free movement improvement assessment on our Pendola Project website. Here, you can get your own personalized protocol that will help your running today. So give that a try. Also, Bobby and I are experts on any question app where you can ask us, well, any question. So reach out to us directly there. Finally, if you learned anything new today, don't forget to share it with your compadres and leave us a quick review. That really helps us a lot. All the links you need are in the show notes below. Till next time, have a great run. Well, that was that was awesome. Yeah.